In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, you glad to be in the house this morning? So good, won't we honour the team for their incredible job and leading us? Thank you. Now, there's a lot of fresh faces up here, but there's a couple of ones that maybe you've seen or you haven't. This is Anna. Everyone say, hi, Anna. I feel like I'm doing a Red Frog talk at a high school. This is Ben. Everyone say, hi, Ben. If you're online, just say, hi, Ben. Hi, Anna, to the screen. No one will think you're weird, I promise. But uh, this incredible couple are from our Hills location in Sydney. And uh, yeah, we're so grateful that you're here this morning, that Zoe and Luca made the trip up with you. And uh, Locke Holmes, who used to be the creative pastor here, has stepped into a role centrally over creative. And there's six locations across Australia. One of them is Hills. And so what the great thing about this network is that people can come here and bless this house and we can send people to bless other Elevation locations. And so uh, I want to thank Ben and Anna for serving us this morning. I want to thank you for that, for getting up early. Daylight savings, I think you're up at 1.30 a.m. Queensland time. So they're already on the second day of their work week. (laughs) But uh, I want to thank you so much for being here and you'll continue to see new faces, but you can find your seat as the team heads off this morning. And just before I jump into my message, I won't take long around this. I want to again bring to our attention something that's coming up in a couple of weeks called our volunteer appreciation. The truth is Elevation Church happens and environments like this occur because of a group of people who are on team who partner with us to create cool environments for people to encounter God. And so can I say, every time you've walked into an interaction or an environment with Elevation, it has not just happened because we've got some genie bottle somewhere that we just rub, ask a wish, and everything just appears. But there are people who are here early, before services, after services, for events, running life groups, youth on a Friday night, missions, outreach. There's a plethora of things we do which are possible because of those who are on team here at Elevation. And so we want to create a night at the end of the year. It's on the 28th of October, 10 a.m. here at the church. There's going to be food, fun activities. It's going to be great for the whole family. We'd love you to be there. We want to honour and celebrate all the volunteers. And so you'll be able to register this week or you'll be hearing from your ministry leader or team lead uh, around the next steps for that. But we'd love for you to save the date for that. But uh, my name's Isaac. If you don't know who I am, now you do. Uh, So glad that you are here and those online, glad that you're joining us as well. And uh, I just love being in the house of God. Do you know, the truth is there is no better environment you can put yourself in than the house of God with the people of God engaging and encountering the presence and the power of God. It does not matter your leadership or personality, style or profile, whether you've scored this on a disc, this on an Enneagram. If you don't even know what those words are, trust me, you're still valid as a human being. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful for you. It doesn't matter your age or your stage of life. It doesn't matter your income, your social status, how popular popular you think you are versus how much you actually are. It doesn't matter if you're married, dating or single. There is a truth that goes beyond all of those things that says this, the presence of God can still transform your life. And so as a church, we believe in these environments to create, to see us encounter the presence of God because we know it can completely transform a life. And I'm convinced that in our current world, what we need is a church full of people who are full of faith that still are just as crazy and expectant to believe that God can move. That the words anything is possible is not just nice lyric that we can sing and feel good about, but it is the truth of a God who still does what He promised through Scripture. And so let me tell you, this morning, it is a good thing that you're planted in the house of God. It is a good thing that you're found in environments like this. We at Elevation are not a spirit-dead church. We are a spirit-led church. And so believe that Holy Spirit today is going to encounter all of us in, in a real way in our life that we'll experience breakthrough, especially as it pertains to relationships. And so if you are a guest here, you've walked in on week two of a collection of talks titled Genuine, which is all about this, real relationships in a superficial world. Now, there is no doubt that we live in a world that is hurting and in desperate need of genuine relationships. Relationships that go beyond the surface level, go beyond the superficial, go beyond the shallow, go beyond just the hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And we keep going. We need relationships that are life-giving, faith-building, healthy, and genuine. You know, I believe this to be true. The quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. 
The quality of the people you have around you so impact your world that they will determine the quality of your life. How you interact with people matters and makes a difference. It makes a difference and matters in your marriage. It makes a difference in your workplace. It matters in church. It matters in your family. It matters in the interactions that you have. And if you want a thriving life, then we need to become good at relationships. So I love collections of talks like this because sometimes what it does is it serves as a reminder around what really matters and how we can build healthy, life-giving, genuine relationships. And last week, Pastor Miles kicked off the series with a great message. And can I encourage you, if you haven't heard it, you can listen to it on Spotify, on Apple Music. If you're visual, you can watch it on YouTube. But he had two points around creating healthy relationships that are genuine, not superficial. And they were simple, 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 simple. One, be open. Like, just be open. Just take the mask off with people and the facade that you think you have to keep up a certain image and let someone in. Be vulnerable. Be open with what you're going through. And then secondly, just be present. Just put the phone down and talk to someone. The silence is deafening. All of you are already reading the Scripture. Somehow you know, I don't, I don't quite get it, but you're reading the Scripture on your phone already. Today I want to continue this series and I want to look at what the Bible has to say about how we can build healthy relationships and three commitments we can make to make sure that there's healthy relationships in and around our life. And I've titled today's message, Costly Connections, because here's the truth. Every relationship will cost you something. It'll cost you to step out of relationships and be isolated and on your own. The cost might be negative, but it will cost you something to opt out of relationship. But it will also cost you something to opt into relationship. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you sacrifice. It's going to cost you getting hurt sometimes, but continuing to show up. There is a cost attached to relationships, whether you decide to opt in or opt out. And so friend, the question to each of us is what cost will we choose? So we're going to read from Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 20. I'll read it from the screen behind me um, because my paper Bible, uh, I can't be bothered opening. And one of the scribes came up. Don't laugh because you don't even bring a paper Bible, all right? (laughs) That's funny. We can joke in church. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well. This is Jesus they're talking about and how he's responded to a different situation. And they asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. How many have heard this before? The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly, by the way, the audacity for someone to tell Jesus is right. I just think that's funny. It looks a lot like my marriage. You have truly said that he is one. (laughs) And there is no, I'll let you put characters into that situation as you deem fit. Uh, There is no other besides him and to love him with all your heart, with all that your understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. One more slide. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. You know, we can take from this, whether we're familiar with that passage or not, that in Jesus' concluding statement, you are not far from the kingdom, is to say that relationships and doing them well are paramount to existing and living in the kingdom of God. So we're going to look at that this morning. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you in your name that there will be breakthrough this morning. We pray in your name there will be freedom this morning. We pray this morning that your life uh, would rise up on the inside of us, God, that the words of Scripture would not just be empty sentiment, but would be seed in our heart that would bring a fruit. And so God, I ask that you'd humble me just to speak your truth and your message this morning. Every power of principality that would raise itself up against the knowledge of you, Jesus, I ask that it's taken away, that there's clarity and receptivity to hear from you this morning. Everyone said? I've got to be real with you before we get going and, and just confess something, if that's okay. As an individual, I am terrible at organizing finances, like terrible at it. I don't know when things are due. I know after they say that there's been dishonored because that money wasn't in there and I didn't transfer it, but I don't know before the event and I'm just terrible at it. So Sophie just tries so hard to get me on board with it, but there she, she came out at the right time. Um, I try so hard to get me on board with it, but I'm just terrible. So I've started new things and I'm reinventing myself and it's kind of working, but there are a lot of times that I am terrible at renewing doing things that have expired. I had one of these interactions not long ago where I was signing up to volunteer with something and I had to put into it my license. 
And so I went through the whole thing and I put my license number in and the expiry date and the, the, the license number and all the other things, the state and everything else you have to do. And, and I pressed submit on the form and it said, sorry, invalid license. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. I might've put it in. I cross-referenced the numbers and I put them in again and submit, invalid license. It's like, this is so weird. I don't quite know what's happening. And as I picked up my license, I looked, it had expired about six and a half months earlier than the date that I was on. So I had been driving around with an expired license for about six months. If you work for the government, I've done it now. Okay, you don't need to snitch on me. I've paid it in due. But see, the funny thing is, is it's, po it's possible to drive without a license. You can do it at your own peril. You can drive without a license, without renewing it, without paying for it. But really, it's just disaster waiting to happen because it will either cost you money if you get caught and have to pay a fine or there will be no protection from your insurance company because you're driving with an expired license. So you can drive without a license, but it is disaster waiting to happen. See, can I submit to us today as followers of Jesus and our interactions with church is you can exist in this environment without relationships, but let me tell you, it is disaster waiting to happen. You can live this life without deep communion but friend, it is a disaster waiting to happen. A life without relationships will cost you something. It can leave you isolated and on your own uh, at the peril of the enemy to feed your mind with lies about yourself, about God and about the church. In fact, loneliness and isolation is actually hurting you probably more than you know. See, loneliness is not just a social condition. It is actually a health risk. Risk. If you don't believe me, there's just some studies that I've pulled together, but there is lots on this. Just a quick search will show you. Uh, the University of Chicago social neuroscientist John C. said this, the effects of social isolation or rejection are as real as thirst, hunger, or pain. He goes on to say, for a social species to be on the edge of the social perimeter is to be in a dangerous position. The brain goes into self-preservation state. That brings with it a lot of unwanted effects. Also, I know this is in the US, but the general surgeon actually said this, loneliness can have the same health risk as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Your loneliness can literally be killing you. And what I love is that this notion by these studies and what people have said is not something new. It's just an echo of what Scripture already says. That even at the beginning of creation in Genesis 2.18, God would look at the world He's created and you and I in it. And He would look at mankind and say, it is not good for man to be alone. Let me be, be, be clear. You think we encourage you to get involved with life groups because we need it to look good. Lie. You think that we encourage you to get into life groups because Dean gets a commission for every new life group that gets started. He wish he did, but he doesn't. The truth is we encourage you and invite you to join environments like life groups because we know hardwired into your design is a need for deep, genuine relationships. And see, even this narrative in Genesis is presented over and over again through Scripture. In the Old Testament, you know, it's all about the person of God. But in the New Testament, what's understood is it's actually about the people of God. The truth is your context as a follower of Christ is the family of God. It's a part of the people of God. In the New Testament, the motive was connection, family, togetherness, relationships. You will never fulfill your call outside of the context of the community you're called to exist in. And I know for a lot of us, we don't move on Scripture, but the last few years have shown we all move on science. So if you don't believe what Scripture says, just believe the studies, right? Maybe that'll get you to jump into community. We need to know it is imperative. We need to know and understand that it is imperative to learn how to have healthy, healthy relationships, thriving, life-giving relationships. How many people want to be a part of a church that has healthy relationships, who wants to have more life-giving friendships and relationships in and around their life and their world? Who wants to have genu genuine relationships in their family and their life? I think we all do. Thank you, Brendan. You and I can just hang out all the time and we'll have the best life ever. I think we all do. We all want that. But, but, see, but see, before we can learn how to grow those types of relationships, we have to understand that genuine connections are costly. 
They will cost you to opt out and they will cost you to opt in. It will require something of you. You know, I think one of the biggest reasons why we don't engage in healthy relationships is because we just don't see it as a priority. It's like, well, I'm pretty good on my own. I kind of nailed this whole self thing and I kind of beat to the sound of my own drum. And I'm, I'm convinced, however, that if we are to see genuine relationships happen, then relationships need to become our priority, not our perhaps. Oh, perhaps I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it. Well, Isaac, to be honest, I, I know life groups are a thing and I know I've been in it, but life groups come around and I'm just getting, man, I'm just so busy. I mean, life's full. I just got to get through this month. Then maybe I'll be able to look at it when kind of the calendar clears. If that's the case, you've just made deep, genuine relationships a perhaps. Well, I mean, to be honest, I'm just so tired. I can't be bothered to engage in that level of connection and that level of consistency. I mean, even every fortnight, geez, that's a bit much. I I mean, I have to be at this this event, this work function, this party, this family thing. And I get it. I mean, life is life. And there is so much vying for our attention. But it's why I say we just have to make relationships a priority and a commitment in our world. And so... What happens is that if we live with it, perhaps that we let feelings determine our engagement when it comes to relationships. But see, the problem with feelings is that they are a great servant, but they're a terrible director of your life. You cannot let feelings be the determining voice in your pursuit for genuine relationships. I mean, that's why I think a common answer or rhetoric around life groups and relationships I hear is this. I didn't want to go. But I was like, man, when I got there, like it was just amazing. I'm so glad I went. I hear that more than you could probably count on the entirety of the fingers in this room. And you online. See, feelings, the problem is they'll always point to the reason why we should not engage in relationships that are deep, that are genuine. Well, I'm too busy, I'm too tired. I've been hurt before, I don't need it, I can do better. Really, I'm better than everyone else here, so I don't even know why I'd bother hanging out with them. I'm hanging out with other people. Well, I deserve a night off. Well, I deserve to be the one that people should bend around me for. How do they not know who I am and how important I am? They should be bending around me and my needs. They don't really care for me, they just want to look good. See, feelings will tell you all of the reasons why you should not engage in relationships. I'm not against feelings. I mean, feelings can add to your life, but they should not be the anchor of your life. And when it comes to relationships and community, I just think this is true. If feelings lead your life, then relationships will leave your life. Church, we have to make a commitment to relationships. We have to make an intentional decision to engage in relationships that are genuine. And that starts when they're not your priority when they are your priority, when they're not your maybe or your perhaps. And see, before I continue, can I just encourage us? Like I said, we have to get this base level understanding. Relationships need to be a priority and a commitment. Do not let your feelings determine your involvement. You see, at Elevation Church, there's kind of three main environments that we really believe if you put yourself in those environments together consistently and make a commitment around them, we believe that you watch over the course of time, you will see your life grow, mature, and transform. And the first one is this. It's a Sunday service. We just believe if you put yourself in these environments consistently and make a decision around being in these, in these rooms on a Sunday, that over time your life will transform. When you're in the environment of faith and worship, hearing the Word of God and relationships with others, you need to make a commitment to be in the Sunday service. You need to make a commitment also around life groups. That where relationships go beyond just the hi, how was your week? Great, good, thanks, see you next time. They go deeper. They take the mask off. Like Miles said, you're able to be open and present and be honest with people and hear what's going on in others and you can share what's going on in your life. There's community, there's accountability, and then there's missions. There's things like I love my city. There's global care. There's elevation care. There's lots of things happening that we do where we serve the people outside of this building. We're evangelistically focused, others focused. And we just believe if you put yourself into those three environments, you watch your life over a year transform, mold and change to be more like Jesus. But it starts by making a commitment to relationships. I love what Tim Keller says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. 
To be known and not loved is really our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Church, we need to make relationships a priority in our calendar, in our world, in our value system. It needs to become a commitment in our life. For the time that I have left, I just want to look at three aspects, three commitments that I think if we make and focus on, it will help enhance our ability to have life-giving, healthy relationships with the world around us. So there's three commitments which we read in Mark, right, that Jesus tells us about. And he sums up the whole law and all of the prophets into two statements. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. See, the first commitment we need to make is actually a commitment to our relationship with God. Your horizontal relationship with others is a reflection of your vertical connection with God. Jesus was very clear. The first and greatest commandment is directed towards God. So before we even look at those around us, before we even look at anyone else, we need to look at our connection and relationship with God and say, is there something that is not working out in the connection I have with God? Do I need to dive deeper into a certain area? Do I need help in a certain area? Jesus was clear. The first commandment is directed towards God. And it goes without, without saying, the truth is how you relate to God matters in how you connect with other people. See, the truth is just so many of us cannot even approach relationships in a healthy way or in a healthy view and life-giving manner because we're wanting people to fill the hole that God was only Himself designed to fill. See, as long as you have a weak relationship with God, you will have a wrong connection to other people. It's as simple as that. If your relationship with God is fractured, broken and non-existent, then you will be putting people on a pedestal to fit a place in your heart that only God was designed to fill. But when you see God in His proper light and you have a good relationship with Him, it's only then you can begin to engage with other people in the way that's healthy and life-giving. The way you relate and connect to God will have an impact on your relationships. See, if you're so caught up trying to compete for God's love and earn it, you will end up just contesting and comparing yourself to everyone else. If you're fearful of God and whether He accepts you or not, you will end up being apprehensive and cautious with everyone else around you. If you're unsure of the plan God has for you and the meaning and value of your life, you will end up being self-centered, self-seeking and self-focused because you need to provide security for your own life. If you think God is angry with you and against you, you will end up thinking like a victim and that everyone else is out to get you. Friend, the first thing we need to do is make sure we have a right relationship when it comes to God. And from that place, it is the starting point for all other relationships around, around us. So can I ask us this? Do we truly know that God loves us? Like, do you truly know that God created you with a purpose? Do you truly know that God formed you together in your mother's womb? Do you truly know that God has a great plan for you? Do you truly know that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die in your place so that you could be in relationship with Him? Do we truly know that there is a God who loves us? It's why we say things like be in church. It's why we say things like read your Bible, pray, worship, seek God, chase after Him in your own life, connect with Him. It's not to do religious duty. It's because we understand that everything in life flows from a healthy relationship with God. And let me just be clear. The church cannot be your relationship with God for you. I know for a lot of us, we think that's why we tithe. So Isaac can be my relationship with God. He can pray for me. He can do the God things for me. He can intercede for me. And yes, don't get it wrong. We're here for each other, but there is a responsibility on us as individuals. Let me tell you this. Just because I preach and have a microphone does not mean I get out of stewarding my relationship with God. I still have to seek Him as a son. I still have to go after Him as a son. I still have to invest in my relationship with God. Just because I can open this book and say some words does not mean that I have a perfect relationship with God that if left to its own devices will continue to grow. I need to be praying. I need to be reading my word as a son of God. And you need to be doing that as a son or daughter of God as well. You need to make a commitment to God to say, I will choose to engage with him. I will choose to chase after him. I will choose to spend time with him. 
your relationship with God has to become the starting point for your relationship with everyone around you. And the second thing Jesus says in Scripture is actually you. So he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. But then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So before you can even love others, you need to have a right view and relationship of yourself. Now, don't get it twisted. This is not a message on selfishness. This doesn't mean that you go home to your friends and you say, well, you all need to do what I want because it's all about me before it's about you. This is not what this message is about. But what this message is about is a right, healthy, biblical view of you and me. See, the truth is the view you have of you will be the perspective with which you view others. If you aren't content, then everyone else is your enemy. If we aren't secure, then everything's an invitation for offense. If we aren't confident, then everything we do is reactory. See, we need to get right within ourselves. And the truth is we have been formed, fashioned, designed and created uniquely, purposefully and knit together with meaning and value by God who spoke stars into existence, who spoke the world around us into being. He created each and every one of you, not by accident or with regret, but with intention, with purpose, with value and with meaning. See, the devil would love to win the battle in your mind and thought life and tell you that you are less than what God created you to be. The world would love to get into your mind and get you so caught up with confusion and cloudiness over yourself that you exhaust all your efforts thinking wrongly about you that you never even are able to think about God or others. See, friend, for some of us today, I think God is going to bring breakthrough in the area of how we view ourselves. that the lies that have maybe taken up root in our thought life about us that are wrong, that God would free you of that, liberate you of that so much so you would understand you have been made in the image of God as a son or a daughter. So we need to get right our relationship with God. We need to make sure that Connection is healthy and it's growing and it's maturing. We need to make sure that we have a good view of ourselves, uh, that we see ourselves in light of who God is uh, before we can even look at other people. It's when we fully grasp a revelation of God's love towards us and we understand we are made with purpose in the image of God that we can engage with relationships with other people that are healthy and life-giving. So we need to understand genuine relationships. When you get those first two things right, you'll understand genuine relationships are more about giving than they are about getting. Real relationships that are deep, that are meaningful, that add value into your life, it is more about giving than it is about getting. Why? Because we understand who God is to us, that like we sung, He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. I'm going to try and get these right. Anna, are you ready? He is Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner, our victory. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. God is all of these things to us. So from that healthy base, we understand then, man, I've been made in the image of God. I am a son of God who He has plans for, who He protects, who He has added value and meaning to. And from that place now I get to give because I don't need you to fill the hole in my heart that only God was designed to fulfill do you see how it's all connected genuine relationships are more about giving than getting so when we understand that we can operate in a way that's generous that's selfless that's servant-hearted because we are coming from a place of security and peace in who God is to us and who we are in Christ so I love in John 13, 35, Jesus is speaking. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love, have love for one another. I mean, we could unpack this for a lot and I've got 40 seconds. So let's just d- dive into it for a little bit. All people means all people. I looked at the Greek. I'm not a Calvinist. Hey, Ben. <laughs> we'll know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, so much is the impact of how we do relationships in this context that it bleeds out and speaks to the world around us. See, how you interact in the house of God does matter. 
I mean, for a lot of us, I just think we never even get the opportunity to demonstrate the love we should have for one another. I heard one person say, you know, a lot of times it's just Star Trek Christianity on a Sunday where it's like we say the prayer and all of a sudden Scotty's beamed them up and who knows where they are, but the room was full, now it's empty. I wake up sometimes, I mean, I mean sorry, wake up, I do wake up a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes I say a prayer after a service and I go, amen, and I think the rapture's happened. Everyone's disappeared. You know, I know everything going on in the world. The rapture happens, man. I got left behind. Maybe I'm going to hang out with Nicolas Cage. If you, are, if you want to know about eschatology, please come and talk to me after the study of end times. But that's for another conversation for another day. But I mean, we treat church like a drive through do we not? Where we put our mobile order in. Maybe even we hear who's preaching on the Sunday. It's like, well, I don't like them. I prefer the other ones. So I might come next week when I hear that they're on. Uh, it's like we treat it like a drive through We come in, we get out as quick as we can. We never even have an opportunity to experience or show love for one another. In a life groups, we never even go consistently enough to move from just every time. It's like, so what happened in the last four weeks of your life? <laughs> life group's over. You never get to go beyond that. See, when you love people from a distance, it's not real love. It's just tolerating. But it's when you step into the orbit of someone else's world and you see their mess and you see their reality and you see what they're like and what they're truly going for you, going through, that's when real love becomes real. Everything else is just tolerating. Well, I can tolerate you for an hour and 15 once a week because I know in an hour and 15 minutes, I'm not gonna have to talk to you for another seven days. I need to fill my tank up again to be able to pour it out again. <laughs> Stick to notes. No, no one's picking up what I'm putting down. What I'm saying is love from a distance isn't love. So we need to have a right relationship with God, understand who He is to us, a right relationship within ourselves. We understand we've been made in the image of God, seated in Christ, so we can have a right relationship with those around and about us. That's why I love what Miles said last week, be open and present. Just be open and present. It's so simple. Keys can join me and then I'll land the plane and wrap the service up, but... You know, I think a big reason why some of us like loneliness or opt out of deep relationships is because truly we just don't want accountability. Like, is it all right just to, just to be super honest for a moment? I didn't say this to the 8.30 because I didn't know if they could handle it. See, when you live on your own in shallow relationships, in superficial connections, it's easy to justify your own sin. But let me tell you, when you have people who are in the thick of your life, who can see beyond the fake you to the real you, who can challenge you in a healthy way, who can call things out in a healthy way, who you know are sticking through the test of time, who are not in to just write a blog about you, present it to a current affair and move on, but people who are able to go through the reality of life with you, who are in the deep relationship walk with you, who can see things in your life. I'll tell you right now, I am grateful for people who saw beyond the fake Isaac that can sometimes so easily exist on a stage to see what was going on underneath and to call things out and to encourage and to challenge uh, because the world and the enemy will so, often want to get you off the call of God for your life, that you need a deep relationship set of people around you who will keep pulling you back onto the path when everything else in the world will want to take you off it. Let me tell you, don't seek loneliness because you don't want to get challenged. Friend, you and I need deep relationships where people can keep us accountable. In fact, Proverbs 18.1. Now let me give you a little insight. The book of Proverbs is not about promises, it's about principles. So it's good ways to live. Whoever isolates themselves seeks their own desire. They will break out against all sound judgment. Let me tell you, we need to have a good view of God so that we know that we've been created in His image, that He's for us, not against us, that He has a plan for us. I need to know that I am a son of God who has meaning and value and design in, built into me so that when the people around me help put me back on the path of what God's had for you, I'm secure enough to receive it in a healthy way and engage in the plan God has for me in a healthy way. 
You need other people in your life and in your world who will cheer you on, who will champion you, but also people who will challenge you, who will rebuke things in your life, who will call out the God in you. It's God, it's others, it's self. And then Jesus again concludes with this statement. You are near the kingdom when you live like that. One of the tenets of living in the kingdom of God is healthy relationships with God, with yourself and with others. Why don't we stand as I wrap up? It's costly connections. The truth is every connection will cost you something, whether you opt out of them or whether you opt into them. It will cost you, but you get to choose what that cost is. And so I want to pray to close. Uh, Maybe you identify with one of those three commitments and relationships, God, yourself or others. And what I want to do is I'm going to ask you to picture or have in your mind the lowest denominator in those things. So maybe you're here and you're like, man, I just need help in all of them. Well, the first one you need to get right is your relationship with God. So don't be trying to fix your relationship with other people. It's like putting a Band-Aid over something but never addressing what's underneath. You need to get your relationship with God right. Or maybe you think that's really good and it's healthy and you feel like that, that's moving along and it's a good season in that way in your life. But man, it's your view of self. For whatever reason, you just have a terrible view of yourself and it's not what God has for you. It's the enemy's crept in and it's lies and it's uh, whatever it is. You know what it is. Maybe that's for you. You need to believe. I believe today God's going to bring breakthrough in your life in those ways. Or maybe you think the first two are pretty good actually, but there's just a bitterness There's a hurt in your heart that you're harboring that it's just unforgiveness and it's just detrimental to every other relationship. It becomes the view with which you look at every new connection. Maybe it was something in the past, someone let you down and now you're just carrying that into every relationship forward. You think it's always gonna be the same. It's stopping you from making meaningful connections. So I'm gonna ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. Maybe you're here and it's your relationship with God. This is gonna be a two part one. Maybe you're here and you go, Isaac, I don't even have a relationship with God. There's not even a fracture to repair because honestly, it's never been put together in the first place. If that's you this morning, friend, I wanna let you know it's not based on what you have or have not done, but the free gift of salvation is through God sending Jesus, His Son to live a perfect life, die on a cross in your place, be buried and raised to life. So all you need do is acknowledge that reality. So if that's you and you want relationship with Jesus, on the count of three, just raise your hand, we'll pray for you. One, two, three. As I look from the left to the right. Awesome. Well, maybe you're here and you've had a, you've got a relationship with God, but really there's just a fracture in that relationship and your connection with Him, it's just not where it could be or, or it just feels distant or, or, or far off and you go, man, I just need to work on that and, and I need to come back into His presence and His peace and, and I've just neglected chasing after Him. Maybe that is the fracture in, in one of those three ways that you this morning need God to move in. I want you to picture that in your mind. Think about that. I'm gonna pray for you. Give you five seconds if that's you. God, I thank You right now for those people who have that feeling of distance and disconnect in their relationship with You. God, I pray where the enemy has put up barriers that they would go in the name of Jesus and that there would be a new life, a fresh connection in their relationship with You. God, would You bring the Scriptures alive? Would You place a desire to meet with You in prayer? God, I pray there would be healthy relationships with You. Amen. Or maybe you're here and you're that second type of person and really it's just your relationship of you. It's just harmful, damaged, broken, whatever it is. And it's stopping you from engaging in healthy relationships. You don't have to raise your hand in this one, but just for five seconds, if that's you, just identify with that and then I'll say a prayer. God, I pray right now for anyone who has a false and wrong view of themselves, where there are lies in their mind and the enemy has told them and perpetuated narratives that they are not of value, that they have no meaning, that they're an accident, that they'll never amount to anything, that they're just a failure, that God would never love them. God, I break that away. God, I pray that every single person would know they are a son or a daughter of the Most High God, that they would enter boldly into the throne room, 
surrounded by the reality of what you have done on the cross for them, Jesus. Where there are lies in minds, I rebuke it and it must go in the name of Jesus. Thank you that there is clarity in your name. Or maybe you're here and you've, the first two are pretty good and, and really you're just harboring a bitterness and a resentment from a past relationship, a friendship, whatever it is, and it's holding you back from future endeavours. I just want you to picture that hurt, picture that bitterness. I believe God will bring breakthrough. Father, I thank you right now that whatever it is in people's lives, in relationships with one another, that in the past or even currently have been a breakdown in their connection with people moving forward, I pray there would be healing, restoration, a release, and a forgiveness extended on behalf of that other person. God, I pray for breakthrough in that area this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen, amen, and amen. Church, let's just make a commitment to relationships to go beyond the superficial, go beyond the shallow, to build healthy friendships that speak life and the plan and purpose of God over our lives, hey? Would you pray with me together as we close? Father, we thank You for this morning. Everything that's been spoken, everything that's been done, God, would You bring a fruit for every seed that's been sown? And God, I pray that we would leave here with a desire to make deep, meaningful relationships with one another. We love You, Lord. We cannot wait to see everything that comes out of this great church as we build healthy, genuine relationships with each other. It's in Jesus' Name. Every single person said... Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, well, thank you so much for joining us. If you want prayer, come.